Good morning, church family, and welcome to another week of a uh, video lesson for Sunday School. We do hate this is the means by which we're trying to come together, but we're thankful that the Lord has provided these means of getting online and looking at live stream in order for us to continue to stay along with Gospel Project and walk through these next few weeks, particularly with the early, early life of Jesus as we've been looking in Sunday school. And so we're thankful you've chosen to join us this morning by watching the lesson and are continuing to be faithful to stay up on what's going on as far as the gospel project and also tuning in to live stream for worship services. And uh, we're grateful for, that you're a part of our weekly uh, routine. We hope you're joining with some of our, our pastor's class on Wednesday night. And if you have kids or students or college students, you're encouraging them to be a part of our other live streams during the week. And we just ask you if you know of someone in the church, maybe somebody in your Sunday school class, you know, we can't rely anymore on seeing each other on Sundays and, and that opportunity to encourage each other. So we have to use the phone and text and email or whatever means are in front of you. Uh, I just ask that you take a moment and find somebody in our church body today to encourage. Maybe it's calling to pray for them. Maybe it's sending a note of affirmation to them. Uh, but find some way to stay connected to the body and encouraging uh, those that um, you know here at Hickory Grove. And that's the way we're going to grow through this. And the Lord's church is going to be strengthened as we walk through these days. And so we can't wait. I know the longer we do this, can't wait to get back together and see each other. We may not be able to give each other a hug the day we walk in, uh, but we'll at least be able to see each other and uh, to fellowship as a church. And so we are, are looking forward to that day. But in this meantime, we'll be walking through the Gospel Project. So if you have your Bible there with you today as you're watching this video, turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, we're going to be looking at the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. And so as we take these, these steps, you know, we're walking through the early life of Jesus and looked at his birth and now, now looking at him in really preparation for ministry. And this is a part of his baptism and then his genealogy Luke gives at the end of chapter 3. And then into 4, uh, he goes into the wilderness. And so we've talked about this before. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Uh, but the, the point of the Gospels, the point of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is to point us to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. There are other beneficial lessons that we learn. There are other parts of the Gospel that we see. But the primary thing going on in every single passage is pointing to the fact Jesus is the Son of God and that He has come to save. And so... If you take every single passage throughout the Gospels, you see all of them supporting this fact. Luke chapter 1, Luke says, when he's talking about the birth, he's, it's describing when they come to describe the birth to Mary, it says you will uh, have the Son of the Most High God that will be born from you. Uh, you get to Luke 3, and we talked about it last week, there's this affirmation of his sonship at the baptism. Uh, and then at the end of Luke 3, there's this long list of gene genealogy that's proving this is the Son of God that has come. Now we get to Luke 4. And we're going to look at this temptation passage. And it will, it will affirm the same thing, the sonship of Christ. Uh, that's the significance of this temptation. In fact, it seems kind of odd that... You would have Jesus coming for ministry, and he's been waiting these 30 years, and then all of a sudden he comes to the scene here with John the Baptist, and he's down by the river, and everybody's like, he's finally here. They baptize him, everybody sees him, they know, they know this is him, and then he's going to go into the wilderness. Seems kind of weird that you would come make your, you know, in a sense, public statement of, hey, here is the Messiah, and then he, him leave him to disappear for 40 days into the desert. And so uh, why would that be? What's the point of this uh, desert temptation? And, and at the core level, what I want to say, the major idea here is to point to the fact here is the sinless Son of God that has come to save. That, that, that's why we have this in here. It's the point of every single passage in the Gospels. And the same thing is true even here of this temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And so as he goes out in the wilderness, even Satan, it's interesting, 
We'll point to these in verse 3 and verse 9 of our passage. Satan will be, when he asks, he'll say, if you are the Son of God. Even in his question, he will give Jesus his title and affirm who he is. It's an amazing thing even to hear out of Satan himself who Jesus actually is is. Now let me give really three points of application. I'll point to them here early. I'll kind of hit them as we go on and then we'll wrap up with them at the very end. But what's the point of this entire, this entire story? Uh, first is to say Jesus' divinity, that he's God. It's also, we can draw from it, his humanity. We'll see that he was fully human. He was fully God, fully man. And also we'll see his sympathy. What I mean by that is that he understands the road we walk. He understands our temptations. And we'll see that here in Luke chapter 4. So if you have your Bible open there, I'd like to take you to the first point. Before we do that, I'd like to pray for you. Let me pray for you today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the great hope we have in him, his, uh, his, the fact he was God and came down to save us, and this great hope that we find in that. And Lord, we can know that whatever temptation we face today, he's faced it as well. May we find that as a comfort and a strength as we look here at Luke chapter four. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. So the first point I wanna draw your attention to today is that the Son of God is tempted to use his power for his own needs. So that's the first temptation he'll face is that is to use his own power for his own needs. Not, not in trusting the Lord, but for his own selfish needs. That's the temptation we see here at the beginning of Luke 4. Again, he doesn't come out, do his baptism, blast into public ministry. He goes away to the wilderness. We'll read it here, Luke 4, verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. An interesting, interesting phrase here that is found oftentimes in the life of Jesus that I think we miss is, is the fact that Jesus was led by the Spirit of God. Even here, as he had the Holy Spirit descend onto him his baptism, now we see Jesus in particular following the leadership of the Spirit. He is, the, there's the Father's plan, there's Jesus who's the one who's, a, who's accomplishing it, but the Holy Spirit is at work, even at this point, leading Jesus to the wilderness. This is a model for which we'll live our lives. We follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit just like Jesus was following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit leads him, in this case it's strange, into a place of temptation. Sometimes that's how the Lord grows us. Sometimes we're praying like the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, right? Uh, we don't think about temptation in regards to places where we might be led into and out of enough. There are places in which we want to be led away from that. Lord, take me away from that temptation. But sometimes the way the Lord wants to grow us is He takes us into temptation. And in this particular instance, Jesus is brought out into the wilderness and there, this is going to show his absolute sinless life by how he withstood this temptation. And in fact, he truly is the Son of God. So if we look at verse 2, it says, For 40 days, being tempted by the devil, he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. So this lasted for 40 days. So you think about that, it's over a month long. It's probably about how long we've been in quarantine up to this point. Maybe you're starting to feel a little bit of that stark mad crazy and you say this 40 days is a pretty good amount of time. And uh, the, the only difference probably in your 40 days is in Jesus, he didn't eat anything. You've probably been eating a whole lot uh, during your 40 days. Uh, I don't know if I've been feeling that, uh, sitting around the house snacking for 40 days. But Jesus didn't have that. He was out in the wilderness and was not eating. He, he was under this intense strain of temptation. This 40 days of, alludes to the 40 years that the Israelites were in the wilderness. Moses and Elijah both had 
uh, 40 days of uh, fasting that they did. And so you see this kind of mirroring from the Old Testament to this moment, moment where Jesus eats nothing uh, for 40 days and he's tempted. And if you, use, you see the phrase there, it says being tempted by the devil. You get the sense he was tempted the entire time. There was some sort of a testing of who he was the entire time of his time there. And so here's Jesus, 40 days, tempted, and these three temptations will come at the end of the 40 days, at his weakest point. But understand that Jesus knows temptation better than we do. How do you, how do you say that? How is it Jesus, he, he never had, never, he was never really going to give in to it. How does he know temptation better than us? Well, that's the reality. Jesus knows it better because he never gave in to it. If you think about something, let's say you, let's use a simple uh, analogy. Let's say you're a child and you're standing next to the counter and there's a cookie sitting there on the counter and mom and dad say, don't eat the cookie. And so you can't eat the cookie. And let's say it's don't eat the cookie until after dinner. You're going to eat dinner at five. It's four in the afternoon. Well, you stare at that cookie from 4, 4, 410, 420, 430, all the way for that whole hour. Well, well, let's say this child, like most of us might be, and maybe even as I gave the analogy a moment ago, at about 415 gets a little tired of staring at the cookie. Hunger's welling up in their stomach. This kid eats the cookie. Well, from 420, 425, 430, temptation's gone. That, that child only knew the temptation for 15 minutes. But if you don't give in to the temptation, you're going to know that temptation for the full hour all the way through dinner until you can finally have the cookie. My example gives the idea that if you don't give in to temptation, you actually understand it better because it lasts longer. And so Jesus understood temptation here because he stood through 40 days of this and never gave in to anything. He stood against the devil's temptation the whole time. So if you say Jesus doesn't understand, he in fact understands more of what you're going through. Because he stood, he stood against sin way longer than you and I ever have. We give in much easier than he ever did. So he was perfect, never gave in to temptation. So that's why he understands it better than we do. Notice the word here even for the devil. The Greek word is diabolos, slanderer or accuser. That's what he's coming to do here, to accuse Jesus, to try to get him to trip and to fall. Now, the devil is not some sort of omnipresent being. He's not everywhere all the time. He is only in one place at one time. He's not the opposite of God. He's one of a part of the creation God created. And the angels rebel, but angels can only be at one place at one time. And so here's the devil here with Jesus tempting him. And he has plans, evil plans, but the Father's will is to use it for good plans. That's how the Lord can oftentimes use temptation in our life. Even when the devil brings an attack on us, this is the glorious part of what the, God, what the Lord's going to do. When the father of lies, Satan himself, the accuser, is going to come and attack us, he's going to take that and turn it for our good. And so at this point, Jesus will allow this temptation that's going to come along, and it's actually going to be turned for his good. And you also see here, Jesus is fully human. Now, I mentioned that earlier, several different components of it, but I just want you to catch the nature of it here. That, that when we say Jesus has experienced temptation and can sympathize with us, he can actually, he's actually been really hungry. He knows what it's like to have his body demand something and deny that demand. Do you see it here? That when he's experienced it all, when I say he knows the temptation, what we mean here is he's been 40 days without food. And when you go without food, you feel your body craving and calling for it. And then you have the choice to say, am I going to give in to the, what my body is demanding? Or am I going to say no to what my body says? And that is the temptation Jesus faced and said, I'm going to follow what the Lord 
has in my life. And so if you want to understand today what temptation means is to be able to say no to maybe what your sinful flesh is demanding for you to do. He can sympathize with your weaknesses. So he's fully human. He understands every bit of what it means for you to be human because he lived that himself. Look at verse 3. The devil said to him, so here's the devil starting to speak lies. If you are the son of God, there's the phrase I mentioned earlier. If you are the son of God, he calls into question who he is. If you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. He says, turn this stone into bread. If you're real hungry, I know this stone looks like bread. Uh, so just make it bread, right? And Jesus answered to him, it is written, man shall not, shall not live by bread alone. In other words, if you are the Son of God, abandon His plan for you here. Don't trust the Lord's plan. In this moment, do what serves your needs the most. And in the process, He says, if you're the Son of God, why should you suffer in this way? In, in reality, in many ways, He's right. The Son of God doesn't deserve to be in that spot. That's, the, that's kind of the the uh, radical nature of the gospel is that Jesus should have never have been here. He should have been sitting at the right hand of the Father. He should have been living in all glory. But in this moment, in all humility, it was not because he deserved to be hungry in a desert. He did it because we deserve that. Here he is living this out for us. So instead of Jesus using his power to satisfy himself, he is trusting God. And notice his response. It'll be what he does here. He quotes scripture. Jesus said to him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. He's quoting scripture in response to him. Something we can all learn to do in the face of temptation is to learn to quote scripture. I talked about it earlier as learning how to stand, and we'll continue to expand on this idea. But how is it that when you're faced with something difficult or a temptation along the way, how do you how do you not fall into uh, that temptation? What's, what's some practical things you can do to fight against it? I think a, a very simple one is to memorize scripture that directly uh, responds to the temptation you face. Think of whatever you might face. Then memorize a verse on that and then let that be something that encourages you in those moments so that then that way you, you can quote that scripture, you can meditate on it, you, you can carry it with you. You know, even in this, I thought of this verse I started memorizing a few weeks ago, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. I thought, man, you know, whatever is in the ministry and the work we're doing right now, we've had to pivot and do ministry like we've never done it before. And that verse has been a great encouragement to me to know that no matter what we face and whether they quarantine us or what happens in the church, just know that, that keep serving the Lord and keep working at it because it's not in vain. Knowing that in the Lord your labor's not in vain, just trust Him and serve Him. And I thought, you know, that's a great encouragement to me through these times is, you know what, Lord, I don't know what tomorrow ministry looks like, but I'm going to keep serving you and I'm going to keep working for the Lord in these days. And so you might maybe pick a verse that would be of encouragement. Maybe you, maybe you worry a lot. And you, you might want to pick a verse like Philippians 4, 6, and 7 to help you deal with peace in your heart. Maybe you deal with lust or a temptation there. You want to pick some verses in particular when you're tempted. You want to start quoting scripture. Maybe um, you deal with anger and letting your rage get, get control of you. Find some verses in particular that speak about controlling your temper and talk about godliness and being peaceful. And so th there's so many of those things that you ought to use in the moment when temptation comes. Jesus, the Word Himself, quotes Scripture when He's tempted by Satan. I think we could learn a lot by quoting Scripture when we're tempted. The last thing I just want to point to here, and this is the, the overriding piece, is that Jesus was God. And what I mean by that, he was the Son of God, he was divine, meaning he was sinless. That he was absolutely perfect through this whole thing. 
and you already see it right out of the first temptation, he stood strong, did not do what Satan was calling him to do. He was sinless. Let me give you a second uh, point that's in the lesson today. The Son of God is tempted to pursue his reign apart from the Father's plan. The Son of God is tempted to pursue his reign apart from the Father's plan. It's, it's interesting, these, these temptations, if you read them over the other Gospels, they actually change orders. Uh, so the order we have here in Luke may not be the uh, best or may not actually be the order these temptations were in. Uh, Matthew seems to want to kind of give warrant to that those were the order they were in. Uh, so even as we walk through this and say it's the second, it might not have been the second uh, in the order he was given. But let's look at here in verse uh, 5 of chapter 4 of Luke. And the devil took him up and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Imagine what that would have been like. He said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him. He said, It is written. He starts quoting scripture again. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Again, here's a second test to not trust the plan of God. And in this moment, it's almost the question of the goodness of God. Is God really good to you here? In this moment, should you not come to me and worship me, Satan, and not God himself? Because he's not being good to you, and I can give you all these kingdoms, and he's not giving you what's best. Let me give you what's best. What I have to offer you is better than what he has to offer you. He's actually a mean God who's holding back from you, and you need to come worship someone else. The promise here sounds eerily similar to Satan in the garden when he tempts Adam and Eve. When he looks at him and says, don't, don't trust what he said. Come eat of this tree, tree. When you eat of this tree, think of all the great goodness that comes your way. There's so much promised by the one who lies. You have to remember you can't trust him. He's the father of lies. You must trust God. You know, if you think about it, when you are tempted, you have to remember that in that moment you have been deceived that that sin or that path or that idolatrous way is actually better than the way God has given you. It feels as if that's actually the better way for you. That there is more pleasure, more joy, more happiness. You've convinced yourself that's the right thing. But what you have to remember here is Satan is a liar. I mean, he's telling you lies. So remind yourself when you begin to think, let me, let me follow this kingdom. I'm going to do what it says of this world. I'm, I'm going to try to pursue worldly things. It's an absolute lie. It leads to a place you don't want to be, and it's been led by Satan himself. Let's talk about the idea of temptation for a minute. There's a write-up in the lesson today. I'd like to read it to you, in particular, uh, on temptation. So let me read it to you here today. Temptation is the equivalent of, is not the equivalent of sin. Here's what here's what we mean: is that uh, if you're tempted, it doesn't automatically mean you're sinning. Again, here Jesus is tempted, but he's not in sin. So just because you face a temptation doesn't mean you're in sin. It can refer to natural and good desires that are then twisted and directed towards pleasing of self rather than giving glory to God. God doesn't, you know, if you think about the Bible, building up for yourselves treasures in heaven. God doesn't fault you for wanting treasures. He just, uh, your sin comes when you want treasures on earth instead of treasures in heaven. Essentially, the sin is pursuing it in the wrong kingdom. So the fact he's built in you a desire uh, to build wealth and money and to be rich, uh, the problem is you just want to be rich in the wrong place. So it, what it is, you're, you're twisting and you're directed these desires towards pleasing of 
self rather than giving glory to God. Knowing our weakness, we are to be on guard against temptation that may lead us to sin. In other words, uh, I've heard it said like this before, if the sin is wrong, then the road that leads to the sin is wrong. So if you know that when you do A, you're pretty much always going to do B, you probably need to stop doing A. It, let me carry it further. If you know when you go hang out with those friends, when you're around those people, when you are doing this particular thing in this particular scenario, you, you can rationalize in your mind, when I do that, it's not wrong. But you know every time, or almost every time, you do that, you lead into sin, then you need to stop putting yourself in that position. What it means here, we should be on guard on the temptations that lead us to sin. That's why we say, Lord, don't lead me into tem to sin. We would actually say, when we say the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. It's, it's right to run from temptation. Joseph, when he's sitting there in Potiphar's wife's propositioning, he just takes off running. He doesn't sit around and try to say, let, let me set up these lines here. He just runs. He doesn't want to stick around and let his mind have a chance to fall into temptation. So we must be on guard against that temptation, and we must pray for God to deliver us from evil. And so that's another component we haven't even talked about, is beginning to pray and asking the Lord to help us when we face that temptation. So in those moments, not only quoting scripture, but we're praying and Lord, turn my heart, turn my affections. I know I want to do this right now. Help me to want to do something else. And so we're battling and we're fighting. If I can encourage you today as we talk about temptation, I'm sure there's a part of your life right now that is, there is some sort of sin or something rearing up in your life. As that comes along, here's the biggest thing I would encourage you not to do. Don't stop fighting. Don't stop pressing for holiness. You may have failed the past few days or you may feel like it's getting the best of you right now. Don't give up. Don't give in to it. Today, I want to encourage you, pick up your strength today and work, man. Start pressing, start praying, start memorizing scripture. Fight for your holiness so that you might fight against temptation. Don't, don't quit fighting temptation. That ought to be a part of your walk with the Lord. And in this moment, when we see this temptation come up, we see that Jesus, when this comes, he, he fights it every time. He never gives in to this temptation because he is the sinless son of God. And like I said earlier, temptation doesn't mean you're a sinner. It just means you're fighting against sin. Temptation here for Jesus didn't make him a sinner. It, it proved his ability to stand against that sin because he was the sinless son of God that always trusted that God had his best interest in mind. So, so trust God's goodness today. Even though Satan is the father of lies and is pumping lies into your mind, trying to tell you the good is found somewhere else, it's always found in God himself. So let's look at the third uh, point of the lesson today. The Son of God, this is the third temptation, is tempted to test his father's promise of protection. He knows God is the one who can protect and care for him, but is, is he the one that needs to take that on himself? The, the ter third temptation, notice the devil's going to bring up the fact he's the son of God again. It's, it's strange to me that in his attempt to undermine his sonship, there's a quiet bit of affirmation he is the son of God. Verse 9, and he took him to Jerusalem. He set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, now just to pause here for a moment, Jesus, somehow, he's able to show him all these kingdoms, and in this moment, they're actually from the wilderness, they go to the, the temple in Jerusalem, and they're actually here on the southeastern corner of the temple. So it's up on a, they call it the Temple Mount for a reason, it's up on a hill, and there's a lot of valleys, you kind of look out over all of Jerusalem, and up on this hill, he's actually looking out, and on the southeastern, I thought this was interesting, in the southeastern corner of the temple, looking out over the valley of Kidron, and it's actually looking out, the Mount of Olives is over there, as we were looking at all that last week. You can see all that from the southeastern corner. 
And on the southeastern corner as well, not, not so many feet from there, Jesus would have been teaching. We talked about Passion Week, if you followed our devotions. Uh, last week we talked about how Jesus would have been up on the Temple Mount teaching with the, the, the leaders and he would have cleared the temple and all those things. They happened all just not but feet from where he's standing and being tempted right here. Look at verse, um, look there at verse 9 again. He, he took, takes him up to the pinnacle of the Temple Mount. He says, if you are the Son of God, there's the question. He says, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So he's quoting here Psalm 91 to Jesus. He's quoting scripture to Jesus. Verse 12, And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put, your, put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until... Notice he didn't leave him alone until an opportune time. So Jesus comes up here and he quotes scripture to him. Now here's just a, just a pause for a moment talking about quoting scripture. This is a great warning against false teachers because you can't take the fact that somebody is quoting the Bible in their sermon and talking about it in a way that might seem right to that particular verse as truth. You know, if you read Psalm 91... Here he is saying, he will command his angels concerning to guard you. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. That sounds like he'll call angels and he'll pick you up. If you just take that verse. But the problem happens for false teachers, just like Satan being the king of false teachers, is that he takes that verse out of context and makes it mean something it doesn't. That's what happens with false teaching we see today. There are preachers taking scripture and twisting it to mean something it doesn't. And Jesus will actually use a principle here that we use in interpreting our Bible today. We use scripture to interpret scripture. We believe that the whole of the Bible is communicating something. And so we would take another verse and another verse, we put them together and then we go, okay, that, that makes sense. I, I know now what this means over here because I put it all together in a fabric. And so again, the warning against the false teacher is does that scripture, even on plain reading, you might go, well, I think that's what that means, but does it fit with the whole of the rest of the Bible? And that's where these false teachers are just pulling things out of the Bible that don't mean that. They're saying things that aren't true, even if on surface level you might read it from that passage. And Jesus calls him on it here and quotes to him from Deuteronomy as he's done many of his other passages. He says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. He says, I'm not going to put him to the test. I'm not going to intentionally step out here and demand God do something in response of it. This is something we do sometimes. The temptation is to say, I'm going to step out here, and God, you got to do this. And if you don't do this, God, if you don't respond the way I'm telling you to respond, then I'm going to reject you or blame you or become angry at you. In other words, I dictate, God, what you do. You don't dictate what I do. So for us, we, we have to be careful to not step out in faith and say, well, God, he didn't answer me, so he's not there, or I'm angry at him, or I'm bitter at him. We have to trust that he has a plan and that it's not our plan always. So we're going to have to submit to him. Jesus here, ultimately, he'll say, I submit to your plan, Lord. I trust you. There are three dimensions here of Jesus' temptation. I talked about it. His divinity. The entire time, Jesus' sonship, the fact he is the son of God, is proven. He, he never gives in to a temptation. He is God himself. He's absolutely perfect. And so we see that woven all through this temptation in the wilderness. You also see the second, he, um, he is fully human, meaning that he experiences hunger. He experiences being tired. He is physically exhausted. He's at his weakest point here, particularly at the end of 40 days. He's feeling that. So we see he's fully human. We see his humanity here in this passage. And the third one I want to just end with this, we see his sympathy. It's kind of a strange word I might use, but I use it because it's biblical. The Bible describes him this way because he is able to understand our 
weaknesses. He can relate to us. He knows what it's like to walk in our shoes. He knows what it's like to walk in your shoes. He understands the struggles. I'll read a couple of verses from Hebrews. Hebrews 2.18. This is a verse actually I started probably a week or two ago memorizing myself. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Th this, is a, this is an encouragement to us because he's been through this road. He's actually able to help you when you're tempted. He's there for you right now. If you're a Christian, a believer, and a follower of Christ, be encouraged today. He's able to help you because he's walked the same road as you. And then Hebrews chapter 4, uh, probably in my mind, uh, when you think about Jesus understanding where you're at and walking your road, I, I can't think of a better passage uh, than verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with uh with our weaknesses, meaning he, he understands what it's like to be tired, hungry, worn out, to have his body craving something. We don't have somebody like Jesus who doesn't know what that's like. And that's why I say unable to sympathize because he is able to sympathize. But, in, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and then here's what happened in the wilderness, he is yet without sin. So tempted as we are, yet without sin. It's a good verse just to, to, to take. Think about what Jesus did. He took a Bible verse, and he read the other one through it. I think it's good to take Hebrews 4 and look at the wilderness through it. You, you really see this verse come to life as you see Jesus kind of living this out there in Luke chapter 4. Verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to this throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's, that's the real encouragement today is that when we look at a Jesus who has been tempted in every way, he is able to sympathize with our weaknesses, and he's able to help us in that temptation. He's able to strengthen you in your time of need. And so I don't know particularly what's been unique to your time in this quarantine. Your temptation may be to not trust God and become bitter because of the challenges. Some of you may be dealing with some significant anxiety and worry during these days because you're, you know, if you, you're going to come out of the house, you're going to be afraid to hug a person or shake their hand or what may be around the corner. Some of you may uh, just be missing contact with other people. That, that helps you be happy. And maybe depression is starting to set in. Or, or, or some of you may be tempted to, in these times, engage in sinful patterns of behavior you know are not right. Whatever it might be, whatever temptation you're facing today, Jesus understands it. He sympathizes with it, and he understands it even better than you do. And today, he's able to help you and to give grace even in these times of need. May that be an encouragement to you. Trust in Jesus, run to scripture, run to prayer, and fight for your holiness. Fight for to be like Christ and to walk with him today because he's there to help you as you pursue him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the great example of the Lord Jesus Christ and what great hope we have in him today. Lord, I pray for each of the men and women who are listening to this lesson right now. Lord, strengthen them as they try to pursue you, Lord. Help them to turn from temptation, turn to Christ, and may they find the help they need. Uh, to walk with you today. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.